Rally Vertigo, where skeletal lives are known. I remember Halloween. Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. You know, happy Halloween, by the way. Uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, this whole reviewing books thing came a long time before YouTube. And one of my favorite musicians just so happened to be the first one to ever do it. So let's travel a little bit back in time, shall we? Glenn? Welcome to my book collection. I like your shirt. What you got for us? Go. The Well by Montague Summers. This is great. There's lots of great werewolf stories in here, all documented, all true. The werewolf. The Werewolf by Montague Summers. Throughout the centuries, Lycanthropy has been known to the Greeks, and it is terribly prevalent in Eastern Europe today. A horrid legacy from Arcadia of old. So difficult is it to eradicate the foul arts of sorcery. So sleepless is Satan in his craft. So, the werewolf is an ancient legend in European cultures. The idea that under a certain given set of circumstances, the moon being full, for example, the man, the woman, or the child in question will turn willingly or unwillingly into a wolf. Growing hair, sprouting fangs, and while in his or her state, loses himself in a raving bloodlust. The anecdotes and stories come from a thousand different sources, all supposedly true, of course, and there are references to the infamous witch-hunting Bible, the Malleus Maleficarum by Sprenger and Kramer. And in fact, our author, Augustus Montague Summers, who was a British priest, was the first one to translate the Malleus Maleficarum into English. He wholeheartedly believed in what he wrote about, which happened to be vampires, demonology, and the subject of today's review, werewolves. Not without reason did the werewolf in past centuries appear as one of the most terrible and depraved of all bond slaves of Satan. He was even whilst in human form a creature within whom the beast, and not without prevailing, struggled with the man. Masked and clad in the shape of the most dreaded and fiercest denizen of the forest, the witch came forth under cover of darkness, prowling in lonely places to seek his prey. By the force of his diabolic pact, he was enabled, owing to a ritual of horrid ointments and impious spells, to assume so cunningly the swift shaggy brute that, save by his demoniac ferocity and superhuman strength, None could distinguish him from the natural wolf. The werewolf loved to tear raw human flesh. He lapped the blood of his mangled victims, and with gorged, reeking belly, he bore the warm offal of their palpitating entrails to the Sabbath to present an homage and foul sacrifice to the monstrous goat who sat upon the throne of worship and adoration. His appetites were depraved beyond humanity. In bestial rut, he covered the fierce she-wolves amid their bosky lairs. If he were attacked and sore wounded, if a limb, a paw, or ear were lopped, perforce he must regain his human shape. And he fled to some cover to conceal those fearful transformations, where man broke through the shell of beast in horrid confusion. The human body was maimed or wounded in that numerical place where the beast had been hurt. By this were his bedevilments not unseldom betrayed, and he was recognized and brought to justice. Hateful to God and loathed of man, what other end, what other reward could he look for than the stake, where they burned him quick and scattered his ashes to the wind? It's pretty good. So obviously, many of the books compiled and referenced in this book, which there is a hefty bibliography and index in the back of this. Many of them are so imaginative in their descriptions, so specific in their gruesome discoveries, in the detailing of the crimes committed by the possessed, witches who are werewolves, or the, the, um, the, uh, the henchmen, or, or uh, conspirators of Satan. 
the warlock, the witch, or some sort of manifestation or person who has an association with Lucifer. But also in the equally disturbing and occasionally even more violent treatment of said crimes, or you know, the punishment usually perpetrated on this suspect who by today's standards would seem pretty, you know, innocent. This is nothing new. Certainly the Spanish Inquisition was a long period of perfecting the art of torture. As if it were the collective yearning of mankind to discover how many ways human bones could be broken, skin could be stripped, orifices could be penetrated, what the average vocal range of the screams were among the damned and accursed. How many different ways we could feel pain. How many ways man could find to be cruel to his fellow man. The rule of treating pain with even greater pain flourished and became very popular. An indefatigable religious onslaught of murder and sadism which predated Sod, and Lord knows gave him way more than enough material to get started with. This is the realm of werewolf. This is uh, the atmosphere that permeates the texts, and it's all in, you know, Old English and French and Latin and Greek and, uh, you know, the, the, the V's are shaped like U's and it has all of these, you know, everything's spelled differently. There's a lot more R's and Y's, you know, so it's, uh, it's great. Plenty of Greek and Roman historical anecdotes for good measure. Wolves are described as many things, culturally speaking. If you don't know the legend of Romulus and Remus, they were the founders of Rome, the two brothers. According to the legend, their mother was a wolf. There's actually many, there's many famous statues depicting this. Again, wolves are also seen to be the agents of Satan, to be the henchmen of the devil in disguise. But interestingly enough, they are also seen in some cultures to be the wrath of God himself. The legend of the werewolf has been around for hundreds of years and it has invaded popular culture, of course, just like all the other, you know, like vampires and demons and, and the devil. It occurred to me that a lot of the younger folks who are watching the channel probably have not seen Lon Chaney in the original universal horror Wolfman films. Lon Chaney plays the tortured young man who succumbs to the lycanthropic disease uh, cursed by the gypsy. He had the greatest face and demeanor for this character, this pained and anxious gaze at the moon when it was becoming full, knowing, full, knowing what was going to happen to him. Deeply terrified and loathing of himself and having to constantly move and travel. Perfect casting. If you've never seen it in the slew of sequels and the semi-sequels, including the brilliant comedy Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, which I think was my absolute favorite was when I was a kid. I must have seen that more than any other film ever. You've got to watch all of them. They're amazing. But Lon Chaney is a perfect example of this archetype, this character, the cursed man, the cursed man who is a werewolf. The man who unwillingly changes, who must kill, who is damned, by all rights is damned condemned to living with this hideous affliction. On the other hand, there's this whole other archetype of werewolves who are quite willing, and even those who have served Satan for years, who are given this attribute uh, to add to their arsenal, you know, as, uh, as a reward for years of evil deeds, being in conspiracy with the devil. With regard to the voluntary werewolf, under whom, for this consideration, we may include any kind of shape-shifting, in the first place, an essential circumstance and condition is a pact, formal or tacit, with the demon. Such metamorphosis can only be wrought by black magic. Again, the werewolf is a sorcerer, well-versed, and of long continuance in the devil's service, no mere journeyman of evil. Just as emperors reserve certain rewards for their veteran soldiers only, so the demon grants this power of changing themselves into different shapes, as the witches believe, only to those who have proved their loyalty by many years of faithful service in witchcraft. And this is as it were a reward for their long service and loyalty. A great film about a much less repentant werewolf is the adaptation of Angela Carter's uh, The Company of Wolves, which is this kind of dark, gothic, erotic take on Little Red Riding Hood. 1984, Neil Jordan, who directed Interview with the Vampire. Great gothic schlock horror film. Excellent soundtrack, and it's got this onslaught of gruesome 80s special effects. The man doesn't really change into a wolf so much as the wolf sort of emerges from the orifices of the man. <laughs> That's a brilliant scene, and one you will not forget. So if you need something to watch tonight, there's my recommendation. So the book is composed of all of these anecdotes, all of these warnings and these stories and uh, from all these experts on the subject, religious or otherwise, experts on the subject. 
For example, Gervais of Tilbury writes that according to many authorities, the werewolf recovers his shape if he be maimed and a member be locked off his lupine body, like I had mentioned earlier. It is also alluded to, and this one is really interesting, I didn't actually make this connection before, although it's painfully obvious. It is alluded that the wolf is the sworn enemy of Christ, since it eats the lamb, the animal that represents Jesus. But more interesting than the theories of the affliction or the theories of the, uh, the cures are, of course, the real-life stories, which take place all over Europe. Sightings or murders by werewolves or convictions of, uh, of uh, werewolves that were caught and turned back into humans or those suffering from lycanthropy. And this is distinguished by, you know, uh, ordinary folk who go crazy and actually just think that they're, they're, uh, they're wolves, even though they, they still look like a human. There was this one character that they described who got, you know, uh, put in jail who was suffering from it and he kept demanding raw meat and then they would give him some raw meat and he would take two bites out of it and then he would say, you know, it's, it's not rotten enough, it's not putrid enough and he would hurl it back at them and then he would say, look at all my hair and look at my nails, they're growing so long. Of course he looks, you know, totally normal if not just a little bit, you know, crazy. Like in Dura's Woodblocks, or in Goya's Paintings, or in the Danish film Haxen, or in the newer film The Witch, or in any of the descriptions from way back, the, the Sabbath is heavily connotated with some element of eroticism, black eroticism, evil sexuality. There was the feeling that there was always inherently something dark about eroticism, but what it was nobody could ever pinpoint it exactly. It's always presented as something to be reckoned with, something very dangerous. Whether heterosexual or homosexual, it's still this vast unknown, and whenever you hear these descriptions about being in conspiracy with Satan, immediately these, uh, the images of the giant fires and the goat and Baphomet and nude men and women in orgiastic sacrifice in some sort of Dionysian bacchanal ritual come to mind. And sure enough, they explain it in great detail in here, but they leave plenty of mystery. They certainly don't explain it to death, much as they try to understand it, inevitably they fail. But why does it seem so dangerous though? Why does eroticism seem so dangerous? Could it be because these sensations, this violent movement causes one to change, for a metamorphosis to take place, to lose oneself, you see what I'm saying? The connection between these things is not a mistake. But of course there's various accounts of witches controlling werewolves or witches being werewolves or warlocks being werewolves. But it's not just relegated to wolves. I mean you can turn it into cats and boars and lions and hares and wear badgers I think. I mean wear everything. There are accounts of werewolves in Italy, Greece, England, Portugal, France, Spain. A very ancient and widespread tra tradition concerns itself in Portugal with the Lobish Olmen who are for the most part believed to be ensorcelled by some stroke of fate, fado, or slaved by a spell, sina. The Portuguese Lobishamim of the southern province differs in many respects from the werewolf, for he is clandestine and even a timid creature. The man or woman who is under the charm of the wolf goes out by night to some lonely spot, generally where four crossroads meet. After having turned round five times with giddy speed, he falls upon the earth groveling and howling. If by chance some wild animal has previously lain upon the spot, he will assume the shape of that animal. He then rises, transformed to a wolf. But unlike the northern werewolf and the Lugaru, the Lobish Omen seek to harm none. They run about country lanes, but at the least glimmer of a light they gallop off at full tilt into the kindly darkness. They prowl near a cottage, they utter long howls and a kind of sobbing noise, which is taken to be an entreaty for the candle or lamp to be promptly doused. So kind of a depressed version of the werewolf. So the stories and the anecdotes range from like the benign, almost fairy tale, to the, uh, the Gilles de Ray blood-soaked, outrageous stories of perverse crime. On the 14th of December in Paris, a tailor of Chalon was sentenced to be burned quick for his horrible crimes. This wretch was wont to decoy children of both sexes into his shop and having abused them, he would slice their throats and then powder and dress their bodies, jointing them as a butcher cuts up meat. In the twilight, under the shape of a wolf, he roamed the woods to leap out on stray passers-by and tear their throats to shreds. Barrels of bleaching bones were found concealed in his cellars as well as other foul and hideous things. He died, it is said, unrepentant and blaspheming. So scabrous were the details of the case that the court ordered the documents to be burned. 
it would not be surprising if a lot of this was embellished or concocted uh, to try and understand certain things that happened at the time. You know, to to uh, to understand why certain people would do the things that, that they did. We all want to believe in an ultimately good world. It just gets a lot harder the older you get. And of course, in the section on France, as it's divided uh, into sections geographically, in some cases, Greece, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, and then uh, followed by England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, and then uh, France, and finally uh, the North, Russia, and Germany. But in the section in France, of course, we have the Beast of Gévaudan. Classic real-life werewolf story about a real monster of a wolf. Or some speculate it might have even been like a lion or a panther or a tiger or a hyena even. That ravages several French provinces for a year, killing over a hundred people. There's a magnificent adaptation that came out uh, about a decade ago with uh, Vincent Cassel and Monica Bellucci called uh, Le Pacte de Loup or uh, The Brotherhood of the Wolf. I saw it in theaters. Damn, it must have been like 20 years ago actually, but that movie is incredible. The central plot is about the Beast of Gévaudan and the people who are brought in, you know, hired uh, to come in and kill it. But, uh, you know, and the, and the film is, you know, extremely fictitious and it just goes on this completely different, um, surreal, absurdist level. But, yeah, I saw it when I was like 13, changed my life. Great film. Much of what is in the film, of course, did not actually happen in real life. But what I did not know that I learned in this book was there was a boy, an 11 year old boy, who actually defended four other children from this giant monster. And there was an epic poem written and published about him. Everybody survived. Bertefe defended four children from the beast. Yes. So I'd like, the, the poem is not included, but I would like to find that poem. That's the appeal of these stories and these myths. Yes, we know that these things don't exist. But, do we? I mean, that's what we're told. We can look up in the, uh, the online science journals, you know. Kids these days, we don't even go down to the library. You don't even go and check the, the catalogs or anything like that. You look up Wikipedia. Is this true? You know, but then again, I mean, when was the last time you were in the Carpathian Mountains? Or even interacted with a wolf? Have you ever even seen a real wolf? How do you know? And what would it take to change your mind? Maybe not as much as you think. There used to be wolves in Washington. I grew up in the middle of the woods out there. Well, grew up. I lived out there for like a few years. But uh, uh, there used to be wolves out there. I didn't see any. But it made me sad when they when I figured out that they were kind of all, you know they were um, killed, driven out. I met one domesticated, kind of like half domesticated wolf. It was it, it differed so much from a dog. It was amazing the way it moved and its relationship to people. It was extremely concise and very deliberate in its movements and very distrustful of anyone. Very skittish but very in control. I was, in a cap I was at a party at a cabin in the woods and I actually got to see it walk around outside through the woods and it looked like a wolf. It was incredible. So it's astounding that so many things have been written on the subject over such a long period of time and they are all consolidated, packed in here, cited, and indexed. The last chapter even uh, contains a, a piece on the, the, the werewolf in literature, which up until this point, I don't know exactly when this book was published. This was published 1933. Okay, so early 20, 20th century. It's a magnificent Halloween read. The only thing is that there are so many pieces in here in Latin and French with just, you know, the author's kind of like operating in the, under the assumption that you can read both and they are not translated in this edition, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, it's still absolutely worth it. And, you know, I could, I could read most of the French. I got by pretty okay. But uh, the Latin, I was just like, shit, out of luck. I, w I wanted to, to get it, but I couldn't find a decent translator on here. So, you know, uh, unless you have a working knowledge, I'm afraid we're all just gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to learn Latin to read about werewolves. Well, back to Danzig. What did you think about it, Glenn? There's one in particular that's great where they're looking for this guy who's accused of being a werewolf and he comes out of this clearing shaking a baby in his mouth. That's pretty cool. 
Hmm. All right. Now, I don't know if this is the exact story that Danzig is referring to, but I had, you know, his words in mind when I was reading the book. And, you know, there are a lot of stories about wolves eating babies and children. I mean, that's basically like, you know, the nuts and bolts of this thing. <laughs> so it's tough to figure out which one he was actually talking about. But where else on Halloween are you going to hear a Portuguese werewolf story? Lobe Shalmim, Writing in 1870, Oswald Frederick Crawford says that... In Portugal, the superstitions have the peculiar gloomy stamp of the legendary mysteries of ancient Italy. Like Fado, if you ever listen to it, kind of gloomy, very depressing, but anyways. The type of Latin legend to which I refer is that well-known and most grisly and hideous of all ghost stories, the tale of the soldier in Petronius Arbiter. Now the belief in the Lupus Almen is very prevalent in parts of northern Portugal, and nowhere is this belief invested with so many peculiar and gloomy circumstances as in Portugal. He relates a werewolf history which was told him by a farmer at whose manor he received the generous hospitality of the country. When a young man, this farmer was working at a farm near Casabram among the mountains of Estrica, one of the wildest districts of Portugal. The master of the farm had recently married a young wife, and as the time drew near for their first child to be born, it became necessary to engage a woman to help in the many household duties. Accordingly, the young hand was dispatched to the nearest town, Ponce de Lima, with orders to hire the first strong young serving wench he should meet. As he jogged along the road, it so chanced he saw sitting by the wayside a likely girl, wrapped in a brown cloak, with whom he entered into conversation. She gave her name as Joanna and said that she was from Taruca, in the mountains of Beria, of Biera, in the mountains of Biera. My Portuguese is going to suck, I'm sorry. Her object was to... My Portuguese is going to suck, I apologize. Her object was to look for a good situation as a servant in the district. It seemed exactly to jump with the young fellow's mission, and accordingly he suggested that she should present herself to his master. This she did, and although the farm folk thought that there was a strange look about her, inasmuch as she seemed sturdy and willing, she was engaged, and took the mistress's place for a while, undertaking the cooking and the housework. In due time, the child was born, a fine, healthy boy, made much of and lavishly admired by all the neighbors, with the single exception of one old lady, a wise woman who looked askew when she saw the babe. But on being pressed, in a few moments, she... In a few moments, said plainly that the child was under a spell. All laughed, but the old lady maintained the devil's mark could be found on the babe. And sure enough, between the shoulder blades, there was a tiny crescent or half moon, which looked as though it had somehow been tattooed there and appeared indelible. Now the mirth changed to consternation, but the wise woman cheered the wondering parents kindly enough. Only she straightly counseled them to watch the cradle carefully during the time of the new moon. Since, said she... There was no cause for anxiety at any other season. This accordingly was done, and as two or three months went by, nothing happened. It was casually remarked that from the first, the serving wench Joanna exhibited the greatest animosity toward the old lady, and whenever she visited the house, the new maid was sure to be abroad or else sat in a dark corner, nursing the sullens with her big brown cloak pulled right over her face. Nothing was said since the lass was known to be extremely hot-tempered, and when in a fury her eyes which were curiously narrow and slanting, would literally blaze fire as she snarled out angry words. To her master and mistress, she was always respectful, and not unnaturally, before long, she became the complete confidant of the latter. One morning, the mistress even entrusted her with the secret the wise woman had disclosed. To her vast surprise, and the girl replied, Alas, indeed, it is only too true. I have known it for a long while, only I fear to tell you. Children with that mark grow into lupish omen unless it is prevented before they reach sixteen. Can anything be done, then? Eagerly inquired the mistress. Why, yes, there is a way. You must cover the mark with the blood of a white pigeon, strip the child naked, and lay him on a soft blanket on the mountainside the very first time the new moon rises in the heavens after midnight. Then the moon will draw the mark up through the blood, just as she draws the waves of the sea, and the spell will be broken. In order to save their boy from the fearful doom of the Lobishaman, the farmer and his wife, after some talk, decided to follow this advice. 
There happened to be a new moon some days later, and accordingly, accompanied by servants whom they apprised of their plan, they laid the babe sleeping in his blanket on the warm summer night on the slope of a hill near the house, whilst the thin silver sickle of the moon yet tarried below the horizon. This done, they returned indoors, for no eye must see the working of the magic charm. The farmer, it is true, had expressed himself uneasy, lest there should be any wolves near, but his men reassured him, since for many a long year no trace of a wolf had been seen in the whole neighborhood for many miles around. Nevertheless, he got down his old blunderbuss and rammed it with rusty nails for lack of other ammunition. Hardly had he loaded when piteous cries were heard from the spot where the child was lying. All rushed out of the house to see in the light of the new moon just riding above the mountain crest a huge brown wolf, giant, gaunt, and lean, standing over the body of the babe. The animal's hot fangs dripped with blood, and the narrow eyes were lit with the fires of hell. The distracted father fired as the beast was silently slinking away, and it fell, rolling over with a long-drawn howl, just before it could gain the shelter of the wood. The farmer's lad, who wielded a stout club, ran forward to finish it, but only succeeded in dealing the beast a heavy blow on the foreleg as it shuffled, yowling and limping into the darkness beyond. The child was dead, its throat hideously mangled, and the blanket soaked with blood. When the tiny body had been borne sadly back to the house, it was remarked that Joanna was not with the company, and indeed had not been for some little time. Then the horrible truth flashed upon all. The girl was an accursed witch, a horror of Satan, and as a wolf had killed the child for some black purpose of her own. At earliest dawn, the men followed the track of the wounded wolf into the wood, and not ten paces from the place where the animal had dragged itself away was Joanna lying on the ground covered with blood. She immediately declared that she had hidden behind the trees to watch the child, fearing some harm, that she heard its piteous cries and ran out as the moon rose only to see the wolf bounding forward from the covert. At the sound of the gun, it had turned and fled unscathed in the confusion while she received the full discharge and fell wounded. These, of course, were lies suggested by the devil. She could not explain how her right arm was bruised and well-nigh broken where the lad had struck the blow with his stick. Moreover, did he not, as he himself swore, see Joanna's own eyes glaring and the wolf as the animal wheeled in fury? In charity they sent for the priest, but she died ere he could reach the spot, and they buried her where she lay. Before the earth was thrown on her body, the wise woman who came to see it pointed out that the girl had the mark of the lobish almim on her breast quite plainly, and was evidently one of Satan's wolf pack, a witch of long continuance. She added that she... She added that if she could have seen the girl's eyes, she would have known at once what the evil wench was, for all Lobish Almam acquired the long, narrow eyes and savage look of the wolf. She further explained that if a Lobish Almam can kill a newly born child and drink the warm blood, the charm is broken, and they are Lobish Almam no more. The priest, who had not till then been apprised, once the new servant came, declared that the farm folk were fools, and worse to have anything to do with a woman from Taruka for it was just a foul nest of warlocks and witches. Uh, thanks, priest. Thanks. Now you tell us. God. Always remember that life is too short to trust priests and read bullshit. Lock your doors. Ugh. Hope you guys enjoyed. Have a merry Samhain, a happy Halloween, a great day of the dead, a nice night of all souls rising. Learn some Latin and I'll talk to you guys soon. Enjoy. Good night.